So I'm here with Michael, Dr. Michael Rocha from Hawthorne Medical Associates. He's also the director of New Bedford Wellness Initiative. They host a monthly walk. Um, so we're going to discuss today is healthy heart discussion. Um, Michael's a cardiologist, so we're going to talk about heart. So heart attacks are the number one cause of deaths in America for men and women, and they account for one in every four deaths in America. So let's talk about, so what are some of the risk factors, Mike? Yeah, so there's several risk factors, some of which people can change, others of which, you know, it's really part of their genetics. But the typical risk factors for heart disease include uh, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking, uh, also other things such as a family history of uh, heart disease for uh, women over the age of 55 because they're usually protected through menopause and then men age greater than um, 45 is kind of the cutoff in terms of when um, men and women typically would present with early heart attacks. Um, the other things that we're recognizing that are important uh, for, for heart health is staying active. You know, so exercise is critically important. Uh, also making sure that we maintain a normal waistline, making sure that um, they were getting enough sleep, that uh, they were also making sure that we eat the right foods. So those things you know, are some of the things that are easy, some of which can be changed and others of which can't be changed. So obviously exercise and diet is always talking about prevention. Right. So what a And hypertension as well, I should also mention that. So making sure your blood pressure is controlled is really important. And the other thing is is making sure that, you know, your blood sugar is normal and you don't have diabetes. So if you have questions for Michael, go ahead and post them and I'll ask. What are the signs and symptoms? If you see a, a family member, how would you do you kind of recognize a heart attack? Yeah, so good question. So heart attacks can come in many different um, varieties. Um, the most common signs and symptoms for a heart attack would be a squeezing or pressure in your chest, a burning, usually on the left side of your chest. And classically, the pain would radiate down your arm up to your jaw. And oftentimes people uh, would experience nausea, some vomiting or sweats, shortness of breath, and those are kind of the classic symptoms for a heart attack, but not everybody presents that way. And, and sometimes people could have sim some symptoms that may just be indigestion that isn't really indigestion. Uh, and oftentimes women present very differently where they sometimes have pain in their back, indigestion, or maybe just nausea and vomiting. So, you know, again, what I usually tell people is, is if something's not right, it's best to get checked. So if you don't feel that this is your typical whatever, whether it's your stomach and something's not right, it's always better to err on the side of getting checked out. And if we say that it's okay afterwards, that's great. But you know, what we're trying to do is to prevent as many heart attacks as possible. Uh, try to put myself out of business so people don't need to see me with their heart attack. So in the kind of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was like the saturated fat scare. And now it seems to be sugar is more important. It's just as important, if not, um, into the discussion of causing heart problems. Yeah, sugar is, uh, we've really learned a lot about sugar recently. And uh, the WHO actually advises people, so the World, World Health Organization, to reduce sugar to less than 10% of your calories a day. And, you know, really, too much sugar is leading to uh, problems with weight, problems with uh, tooth decay, diabetes, and all of these things, the diabetes can lead to heart disease. And that's really important. So, you know, I think that being more mindful and more aware of how much sugar that we're eating is important. And also, interestingly, you know, not just sugar, but sometimes how many, how much in terms of refined grains or white flour things that we may be eating sometimes because um, some of those, you know, snacks and treats that we may have may have a lot of sugar in them as well. So what is the right way to eat then? What would you suggest? A, lots of vegetables. You know, as I like to say, we're actually a vegetable deficient country. We're supposed to hit four, uh, five or more fruits and vegetables a day. And in our community, actually right now, only 20% of the people uh, in New Bedford are actually achieving that. And across the country, it's probably somewhere about 25 to 30%. So vegetables should be really, really at the top of the list. In some of the best data for heart, for heart disease and stroke would be for using a Mediterranean approach, which is lots of vegetables, fruits, nuts, olive oil, 
um, and going really low on red meat, um, dairy, and sugar. So, and the other thing is, is also in terms of grains, usually, you know, whole grains are usually a part of the, uh, of the Mediterranean diet and sometimes a little bit of red wine. Anger, so let's talk about that. Usually when you, you kind of watch TV, you see someone getting angry when they, before they, be, they have their heart attack, is that a risk? Yeah, anger, interestingly, they did a study a couple years ago and, and people that have an angry encounter for the first two hours after that encounter, are four to five times higher risk for stroke and heart attack. Um, and you know, the mechanism is not completely uh, worked out, but your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, and actually your platelets, which are responsible for clotting, um, they're more active at that time after having an angry encounter. And it's kind of that fight or flight uh, mentality or physiology where your body's revved up if it were in a fight, you know, to protect itself. So, you know, in those instances, when all those things are happening and it's maladaptive, it can go, it, it can cause uh, problems in your blood vessels. So let's talk about the numbers. When you go to see your doctor, they talk about certain numbers, diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, so it's... Yeah, so good question again. And, you know, so knowing your numbers is really important because when we really look at, like we talked about at the beginning, um, your risk factors for heart disease include diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. It's important to know what those numbers are. Typically these days, you know, you can either check your blood sugar either with a fasting blood glucose, can be done in the morning, or a lot of times people look at a hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker for kind of the last three months of what your blood sugar look like. Um, the blood pressure guidelines or the hypertension guidelines have just changed again within the last couple of years. And usually for people that are age less than 65, the blood pressure really should be less than 140 over 90. And they're typically looking at people being pre-hypertensive at the, at the level of 130 uh, over 80 or above. And so we're really looking to shoot for younger people to have their blood pressures um, lower than at least 140 over 90. For older people now, there were some concerns, especially for people that were very elderly, that the blood pressures that we were trying to obtain may be too low for them. So now their, their thresholds are more along 150 over, over 90, for again, for people that are over 65. Uh, but interestingly, you know, we just had a study within the last couple of months that, that showed that people that had much lower blood pressures may reduce their, their risk of stroke and heart attack. But then again, we have to weigh that with the side effects to the medications that they may be on. So there's more to follow, but right now that's the typical guidelines for blood pressure. Um, for cholesterol, uh, that too changed. And really what people are looking at for cholesterol now is this atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease score, which is you know one big word, but the reality is it's a risk score for developing a heart attack in the next 10 years. Typically people that have very high LDLs, greater than 190 are usually looked at for statin therapy. Uh, people that are diabetics are oftentimes candidates because diabetes goes hand in hand with vascular disease, both of the heart and for strokes. And we also look at this score to see whether people have a high risk of having a, an event in the next 10 years. So this this risk score actually looks at people that have more than a seven and a half percent chance in the next 10 years. And so getting to know those numbers or what those risk scores are are very important. They even have things now that you can actually have your estimated heart age, uh, that if you go in and find a risk calculator, it can give you your relative age for your heart. So some of those things are kind of neat and very available online to figure out how to find those. And uh, very important to know those things, and especially if you have them in a range that's dangerous to get that treated and see your doctor. Are these the normal tests and physicals, or you have to kind of request? Um, there's certain protocols. So for some people, usually, you know, depending on their age, they would be candidate for having their cholesterol checked. If they're young, usually one every five years, but as they get older, that changes. Usually your blood pressure would be checked at every visit. And the, the reason to get your blood sugar checked could be for various reasons in terms of screening, usually probably for people that are completely healthy, somewhere around three to five years, but others are more frequent. Um, again, people that have those problems are gonna get tested more frequently. You were selected as a 2015 uh, man of the year for New Bedford by the Standard Times, and part of that was because of the events you host, the uh, wellness walks, so let's talk about that. You do that every month. Yeah, so we we're actually, as of April 5th, will be our two year anniversary for doing the walks, which I'm very excited about. You know, we started with about 40 people around Buttonwood Park in uh, 2014. 
And part of that was in a response that our community really was identified throughout the state as being uh, underperforming in terms of its health. And we started out as a walk, and that walk has really grown to being every week. So we've been in the summer months and spring months, we actually do it at Buttonwood Park 10 o'clock every Saturday, first Saturday of the month. And in the winter, starting in November through March, we go to the North Dartmouth Mall and walk at nine o'clock in the morning on the first Saturday again. And that's been very, you know, we've had all sorts of people that have participated. Some of my patients that have heart disease, defibrillators, people from the community. And it really is people, we meet people where they're at. So people shouldn't feel like they need to go fast. They can get go at their own pace. And we really welcome everybody to participate. And we even enjoy having the dogs and the pets that would, would join us for the walk around and the kids in strollers. So that'll be uh, April 2nd. So we'll, at the end of this week, we'll be doing another walk and we move it outside to um, the uh, Buttonwood Park. You can click on the link and check out the schedule for those walks as well. And then they're on Facebook and uh, Twitter. So got some questions. So Joshua Pacheco, do oils such as coconut or almond oils increase risk of any heart conditions? Yeah, so the oil question is a very interesting one. And you know, most of the time people are actually advocate for using olive oil uh, for the Mediterranean diet. I think that the, those other oils are less well studied and we continue to have, there's a debate in terms of saturated fat. Um, you know, we, there was a meta-analysis a couple years ago that looked at fats. Again, this wasn't a randomized control study, but they looked at seeing, you know, what kind of fats were bad for our heart. The one thing that we definitely learned is that trans fats or hydrogenated fats, usually in cooking or frying, are bad for our hearts. The saturated fat, which includes coconut oil um, and almond oil, it's not clear. And, you know, what I would say is that probably, you know, again, Nuts are, in general, been regarded as very being pretty good for your heart, especially as part of the Mediterranean diet. And what I would say is, is that, um, you, you know, my opinion is, is that use olive oil as best you can. But I can't a hundred percent say for certain that you know those oils are heart healthy based on good trials. So Anne asked, two thirty one to two thirty five cholesterol, good or bad? One doc said bad, one said good, or not to worry about. Yeah, so cholesterol is more than just what the top number is, and that's a good question because actually knowing the different parts of your cholesterol, so a, the total cholesterol is one portion of that, your HDL or good cholesterol is another portion, as is your LDL, which is typically your bad cholesterol and your triglycerides. 235 is technically above what we usually set for a threshold of 200, so it's a little bit elevated, but some people may have profiles that suggest that some of those other numbers that I just talked about are really good, so that may not be as big a concern. And again, it also depends on other risk factors, whether people have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, as to how important those quote numbers are. Um, again, numbers don't tell everything, and I have patients that have been well treated on their cholesterol and, and can still run into trouble, so important to know that number as being part of your cholesterol, but it's important to know all of them. Let's see, so Roger, yeah, so let's talk about the, um, you have an event this Thursday up in Plymouth, let's talk about that. Yeah, so Thursday, uh, I'm very excited about um, working with my friend Loretta LaRoche. Um, she's opening her Loretta LaRoche Institute in Plymouth at Studio G, and I was invited to be her uh, opening speaker for her uh, Loretta LaRoche Institute. I'm going to be talking about how to have a happy heart, and uh, I'm very excited to be doing that. It's going to be 7 o'clock in Plymouth, and uh, anybody that knows Loretta, she's just a joy to work with, and uh, she's been somebody that's been featured several times at the Zyterian and, and throughout the country for her work as laughter as being the best medicine, and I think that she's probably right on that. So Roger Mello says, my wife has what we believe to be some type of flu, but she's getting, been getting dizzy almost to the point she faints, even while she is driving. What could it be? Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, that's, it, it can be a lot of things. And I think that in that instance there, it's probably best to be seen by your regular doctor just to kind of go over physical and history because, you know, the most important thing on histories is, is the full story. And, you know, as doctors, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't spend as much time as we should listening to the patient because the number one thing um, to come up with a diagnosis is listening to the patient. And, and what I would say is that that one there probably requires somebody to sit down and spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one to figure out what the problem might be there. So Philip has a good two-part question. Which fruits and vegetables are best for your heart? And is it true dark chocolate and red wine daily in moderation is good for your heart? Yeah. 
So fruits and vegetables should be, like I said before, at the top of the list. You know, one of the things to keep in mind is most vegetables are good for your heart. Uh, and as I like to tell people, all the colors of the rainbows because you get your micronutrients by, do, by eating those, uh, those types. Obviously, green leafy vegetables are typically good. Again, the caveat, patients that unfortunately are incumbent or a blood thinner for some irregularity in the heart or for different reasons may not be able to take those green leafy, eat those green leafy vegetables such as spinach and kale. But in general, for most people, that's a good part of your diet. Um, the other part there was... Dark chocolate and red wine. Yeah, dark chocolate is... You know, the studies aren't great, and but I would say that, you know, dark chocolate has probably been shown as best they could, not, as not to be harmful um, and may be beneficial. As the same goes, you know, for a glass of red wine is in generally, in most of the studies, has been a positive finding for heart disease. Uh, but again, the caveat to that is, is that some people really can't um, indulge in alcohol and have problems with it. So it's not something that if, if people aren't, are drinking a glass of wine not to not to start. Uh, Linda Mello Pacheco asks, does exercise help lower blood pressure and cholesterol? It can a little bit. It can improve triglycerides and it can help with blood pressure control. That's right. Exercise, as I like to say, exercise is is probably the the uh, the best exercise in a lot of ways because it's good for mind and body. Um, as Dr. John Rady up at, uh, in Boston likes to say, who's a psychiatrist that talks about exercise, says it's like getting a small dose of Ritalin and Prozac, and it really, re it is, it's like get, it's changing your brain neurotransmitters, and so it's good not just for your brain, but it's good for your heart, and you know, walking's fantastic for a lot of reasons. It could also help with your uh, control of your blood sugar to go for a walk. If you're not exercising, don't go around a marathon the next week, probably lead up to that, right? Probably not. So um, Patrick Whittle asks, is it a good idea to take supplements to support heart health? And if so, which ones? Yeah, good question there. Um, they've done several studies and it hasn't, the most more recent ones for supplements have not been uh, strong to support their use. I like to say that you know the first place to start is that food is your medicine and that food is your supplement. So I really would, would focus in on eating, you know, fruits, vegetables, nuts, um, fish, you know, again, a Mediterranean diet. And in terms of the supplement story, you know, if there's people out there that don't eat any fish, there's some question of whether taking taking fish oil. Every, every two years, people say yes to fish oil. The next two years, they say no to fish oil. So I don't think there's a perfect answer to that. And I don't support any specific supplements that I'm telling my patients to take all the time. So personally, I take turmeric. What do you think about that? Um, I put turmeric in a lot of things, absolutely. And you know, the heart benefit for that, you know, a lot of these things aren't, you know, again, the problem with some of the supplements and the things we put in, they're not well studied, right? So nobody really wants to study them because there's a lot of, not a lot of money to looking into a long-term study. I'm not gonna be, be able to do a study of you know, 200 people that take turmeric or not. You know, again, it may have some benefit, but um, it, it usually is, is it tastes good. <laughs> so Lisa asks, what is the best type of exercise for someone who is bottom heavy? Um, whatever you can do to get moving. It's a good, you know, people need to be able to move. And I, I like to take, a word that, take away the word exercise because exercise kind of has this, this barrier where people feel like they need to go to the gym or they have to, you know, kill themselves in order to get healthy. It should be movement to start off with. So you know, if people are able to go for a walk, do some stretching, do Tai Chi, do yoga, um, throw the ball around with the kids. You know, some of the things that we, we forget are moderate activity includes just gardening as actually moderate activity. So, you know, try to think of those things that, um, that you can do to keep moving. So I have a, here's something I'm not sure it might be a, a diagnosis someone's asking. So Bethany says, if you change your lifestyle, exercise, and diet after having PE, but have factor five lighten at age 22, is it possible it won't happen again and what to avoid? Yeah, so uh, pulmonary embolism, you know, some people are prone to that. And, uh, you know, factor five lighten is a genetic uh, deficiency that can lead to clots. You know, even in the even in changing your diet and all of those things doesn't change the genetics of that necessarily. So I'm not so sure that, you know, those things are so important for your health 
but I don't know that that's going to necessarily reduce the risk of having another event and that unfortunately that is a genetic thing and like we talked about before at the beginning certain things we can't change and that are our genes you know some people have a very strong family history of having a stroke or heart attack or have a genetic abnormality that results in excessively high blood pressure or excessively high cholesterol despite eating all the right things so and in that instance there I would say continue to do all those things but I can't guarantee that it's going to be able to prevent something so Calvin asks, what's the best exercise for a 14-year-old? Do you think there's really a difference between a teenager and an adult for exercise? At 14 years old, probably not. But, you know, again, listening to your body. So, you know, as kids are growing, you know, you probably, you'd probably the best thing to do is to mix it up. You know, not just play one sport, not just do one thing. Uh, because sometimes you can get overuse syndromes if you're growing. So what I would say is that make sure... Um, you know, I think the best thing for exercise is to think about making sure that you do some cardio, walking um, is good, jogging, um, strengthening a little bit, you know, and stretching. All those things are important for not just for heart health, but also for overall health. So Anne says she loves gardening, great exercise activity, um, thickened heart walls due to high blood pressure. Is that reversible? Um, actually, you know, if your blood pressure is controlled and that you're you know you're working on your diet and all those things it may be it may be improvable not for everybody but you know the blood pressure you know the thickened walls can can um, there sometimes if you think of it being muscle bound sometimes those things can can relax a little bit so Alyssa says she takes fish oil and flaxseed oil I actually take flaxseed as well yep. every day am I wasting my time are these supplements really beneficial to my health yeah, that's, there's a lot of controversy on that. And like I said, it, you, we look at studies every other year. Um, if you're not eating a lot of fish, you know, it, I would say that it's probably reasonable. But again, that it's, it's going to be a cure-all. It may not be. And, uh, you know, really, literally every two years they look at the same question. And it, it, they, they flip-flop back and forth. Um, I think it's reasonable if you're not eating fish to take a fish supplement. So it's all about omega-3s if you're not getting it maybe the supplements are they may be right okay so last one should a person with a family history of various heart attack condition or heart conditions see a cardiologist as a preventive measure are you accepting new patients <laughs> um you know i think that a lot of the things we talk about you know can also be managed by a good primary care doctor in some ways you know it depends on you know what each individual um brings to the table so to speak so you know, everybody's a little bit different. If if there's something that's abnormal that a primary care doctor sees, you know, it, the next level would be a cardiologist. But, you know, I think that one of the things is, is that making sure that people realize that they are their own best doctor. Um, you know, and, you know, when we talk about these things for heart, four out of five heart attacks are preventable through lifestyle. You know, and that's been replicated in both women's studies and men's studies. And actually, a lot of heart failure that's out there, which is a different syndrome, is preventable. So, you know, I think that it's important to get checked, but it's also important to make sure that we're making those decisions on a daily basis, you know, to make sure that we're staying away from having to take all the pills. Um, you know, that would be great is that, you know, we have, a, we have a community that really puts an emphasis on prevention and health and well-being, and it's a, it really is a holistic approach. It really does come down to your diet to your exercise, to not smoking, your stress, your sleep. You know, getting enough sleep is really important. You know, seven hours of sleep is kind of the sweet spot. And they've shown that, you know, two women's studies that people that get less than five hours or more than nine are actually at higher risk of having heart attacks or strokes. So, you know, all those things can't be undervalued and uh, really should be considered. So that was a follow up question by Ricky. So are you saying 8% lifestyle, 20% genetic? Is that kind of? Um, I, maybe 80% of the things that we only know, there's probably other things. Most of the things actually that I, you know, stress isn't really studied in most of these things. Usually it's diet, exercise, smoking, normal waistline. Um, I w there was actually one study that they looked at uh, for women that uh, too much screen time was actually associated with increased risk of heart attacks. So making sure that we're not sitting at our computers too long is really important. But I would say that most of the things um, could be preventable and it probably is at least 80 if not more So Sharon asked if you've had a hysterectomy at a young age How does it impact your chances of getting heart disease been given several different answers? Yeah um, 
you know, again, so we look at the numbers, everybody's different. We use a cutoff of 45 and 55 for women for menopause, but even that, you know, we still see people that are younger that have heart attacks that are women. So it does the hormonal changes of a hysterectomy change what the risk is? The answer is probably yes. It probably moves it up a little bit, but you know, again, that's for a population, not for the individual. You know, and if we have somebody that is extremely healthy and living healthy, again, they may not be having a, not be a very high risk of heart attack anyway. So that's really you know what my uh, my take on that is. So we have ADO Zinda Fernandez having a heart condition called cardiomyopathy. Is too much salt bad for the heart? Yeah. So you know in general we we've traditionally told patients that have cardiomyopathy or congestive heart failure to limit their so sodium unfortunately we don't know exactly what that number is these days traditionally we've we've asked patients to reduce salt to more than um, two grams or two thousand milligrams but a cardiomyopathy is hard to know you know it could it could be from a lot of different things so I can't say for certain without knowing the, the specifics and you know that's ultimately um, it's something to think about in the right in the right person that may have trouble with salt they may need to limit it in certain cardiomyopathies but there's so many different kinds and it's hard to know okay so that was the last question so guys the number one leading death in America for men and women is heart attacks that's one quarter of all deaths in America. So this was Dr. Michael Rocha with New Bedford Guide. Anything you want to end with or? Yeah, really people just love your heart and you know, make sure that um, you, know, you get checked if you have any concerns. Um, you know, people that you know, I usually put out at certain times of the year, you know, it, in, the shovel, in the snow season, make sure that if you've got a lot of risk factors, you've had heart disease, let somebody else shovel. Um, and really use your common sense. You're recognizing that, that it's important to stay active, to eat the right foods, to reduce smoking or find help, and that you know, really make sure that you know, if you feel that you need help, to reach out to your primary care. And also join us, our Sunday program too, we're still going every Sunday at the Boys and Girls Club. And from 11 to 3 every Sunday, we're doing aerobics, we're doing the nutrition class, we're doing yoga, we're doing meditation, we're also doing smoking cessation, and that's all free to the community. Once a month, we have the South Coast Health Van that's there that's doing screenings. We also have the UMass Dartmouth Nursing School that does screenings. And, you know, I really would like to continue where we improve the health and well being of our community one step at a time. And I am uh, grateful for the opportunity to come back to my hometown and be able to do this work and work with our community. So thank you. So you have a couple of questions that chimed in while you're doing that. So are grains good or bad for you? Yeah, so good question, depends on the grains. Um, so typically in the uh, Mediterranean uh, it, diet, that's whole grains. So that is not the refined grains, which are the white flour. Uh, and that has been shown to improve, the, the whole grains have been shown in some studies to improve heart health. Is multigrain and, and whole grain kind of the same benefit or is it kind of stick with the whole? You know, it's hard to know. In general, I usually encourage people to eat, you know, whole grains such as quinoa, brown rice, oats, you know, that are not highly processed, you know, so it's, and it's hard to know because, you know, a lot of the whole grains that are out there in packages, it's like a case by case and it, it's, it's hard to know exactly which ones to recommend. What is your opinion on shakes and dietary, dietary supplements to lose weight? Have you heard of Plexus? It seems to be the new trend. Is it safe or does it... Uh, does things like give you higher chance of heart issues? Yeah, I, so in terms of some of the shakes and some of these programs, I can't speak to what all their details are. You know, my take is usually try to change your diet first with whole foods. Um, we actually were fortunate, we showed the, the movie uh, In Defense of Food, uh, which is actually free on PBS online, but we showed it at the Whaley Museum and David Ludwig, who was part of that, uh, Dr. David Ludwig from uh, Boston, who wrote the book Always Hungry, um, came down and spoke. And you know, again, I think it's changing away from uh, the high carb, low, f uh, the high carb, oftentimes low fat diets that we've been on, to kind of coming into the middle and, and looking more at a Mediterranean approach, which is kind of moderate fat, good fats like nuts and olive oil, and avocados and fish. Um, in staying away from the heavily processed foods. So Ricky asks, how do you convince the mass majority that exercise and loving 
healthy lifestyle and stop using genetics as an excuse? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think that, you know, when, I, when you first start to hear people, they kind of say, oh, forget it, you know. I don't need to take care of myself. Everything's happened to my parents. I'm destined to have that happen. But epigenetics, which is actually very interesting, is something that says that our environment affects the genes that we have. So a lot of people that actually may have a predisposition, if the way they live their lives can really have a huge effect on whether those genes are turned off or not. So um, I agree. I think that certainly there are some people um, that have some genetic things that are unavoidable. <coughs> excuse me, but for many people, they can make a big difference by making sure that they live healthy. So I've been dealing with migraines and dizziness for almost a year now. No one has answers. What advice can you give to stop <coughs> dizziness? I've had tons of tests. No one knows. That might be is that outside of your... Yeah, migraines are tough. You know, headaches are diff difficult. It's not something that I typically deal with in cardiology, but, you know, the first thing is, is is to, you know, it can be from so many different things. And just like I said before in that other question, that's where somebody has to really take a really detailed history in order to understand what, what might be going on and what things may be triggering. So that's, that's, a, that's one that really requires somebody to sit down for a long time on. All right, that's it, guys. Post a question. Michael will check the uh, questions later and, and post a response if there's something new. So thanks again, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day.